Hey guys, so this is going to be a video lecture on um, our, our notes, notes number one, section one, which is what you need in order to do your movie preview. So I'm going to do this video lecture just in case that in class, your class, we didn't finish them all the way, or you were, you're not sure about a certain part of the notes, because again, you're doing the movie preview, which you're supposed to be telling the story, and essentially what I'm going to lecture on is the story. So here we go. We're going to go ahead and open up the notes. Um... And here we go, notes number one, again, the revolution, section one, right here, section one, lead, leading towards war. So again, your assignment is what led towards the war until finally there was an actual shot, and that happens all the way to here. So this is all section one that needs to be in your assignment, and I'm going to go ahead and do the video lecture on it. All right, so leading towards war. So as I mentioned in class, um, this all begins after the British had been gone for a very long time from the colonies. They set up the colonies. In the 1600s, they supported them, they brought more people, more money, um, and eventually the colonies were set up throughout the colonies, and then that's when the British got into a series of wars with France, where they basically abandoned and essentially left them alone. And the colonists were able to do survive and survive and eventually prosper and actually make money with their economy. And they elected their own leaders, they elected their own laws, their own government. So even though they were still technically owned by England, because they were left alone, they started seeing a lot of the independence that a free country has. And they started to act like it. And then all of a sudden, here comes England back when they've been fighting that war and they need to collect taxes to start raising money. Um, and the, the two sides are not going to come together in compromise in order to avoid a war. Every single step of it was clash, 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 was one thing or another. So the British come back with the Navigation Acts and it makes it very clear to the colonists, look, from this point forward, if you are going to sell your crops, um, you must only sell it to us. Meaning that if they used to be able to sell crates of tobacco, you know, just the tobacco is a cash crop. It's a crop that you only uh, grow to make cash, to make money. They used to sell it to Spain and to India and to China that you used to set the price. Now England says you could only sell it to us because we own the colonies and we tell you what the price is. So it meant that the, the profits of these farmers was going to go way down, and then the king would turn around and take these uh, these shipments that they bought from people here in the colonies, and then they would turn around and sell it for much more money, and there were the king was also making profits. That really upset the colonists because now their profits had gone way down. And then began the series of taxes set up for the colonists, like the Stamp Act, that made them pay taxes on newspapers, pamphlets, almanacs, and licenses. Now, to us, we're born in a world where taxes are just normal. We, we learn from a very young age that when you go buy something, you're going to buy the price, pay the price of the item, and pay taxes. And it's just normal. There's a saying that says, basically, there are three things for sure in life. You're born, you die, and you're going to pay taxes. So that's the way we see it. But back then, they had never done this before. So there was a lot of anger from the colonists. It's not fair that you're just making us pay taxes and you don't let us even make any decisions in the government. The king's response or the government's response from England is basically, yeah, because we don't want to let you and we don't have to let you do as you're told, pay your taxes and be a good citizen and shut up, basically. Um, the colonists continue their protesting and anger, and the king is also going to give them another act that's going to make them very, very upset, which is a quartering act. All right, the quartering act basically said that if a soldier comes to your home and knocks on the door, you have to let them in and you got to feed them. Now, if that means that 10 soldiers come for and they stay for two weeks, that means you're going to pay for 10, 10 soldiers from two weeks worth of food for them. If that means that the food that you had been saving for the winter is now half gone because the soldiers ate it in two weeks. That means that's your problem to save and figure out what are you going to do for the rest of the winter for your money, your food. And it really, really upset them. And to show you how much they upset them, when they wrote the Constitution, our Third Amendment is basically the quartering act, saying we don't have to let soldiers into our home and feed them. Now, today into 2020, that's not a very big deal. We don't have soldiers knocking on our doors uh, requiring us to feed them. But back then, it was huge, and this quartering act was like a big slap in the face. And then continued the blows, which was the Townsend Act. More taxes on things that they bought all the time, like glass, paper, paint, lead, and especially tea. All right, they were tea drinking colonies and they were very upset that they had to all of a sudden pay these taxes on tea. All right, so it led to the first violent skirmish between the two sides, which is the Boston Massacre. All right, the Boston Massacre happened in Boston, where there was a center of this anger against England 
Boston had a lot of people who wanted to fight already. Let's go. Let's get take on the British and let's um let's get our independence so we can be free and not have to listen to the king and listen to their government and what they tell us to do. This is the very first time there was any type of violence between the two sides. And it wasn't much of violence. The colonists were pissed off and angry, and they started attacking British soldiers with rocks, with sticks, even with ice, uh, ice balls. So as it was snowing, they would take the ice, pack it really hard, and then they would toss it. The soldiers began to line up. The soldiers began to line up and began to basically tell them, look, we're going to shoot. We're showing you that we're lining up to shoot you. If you don't stop, they continued. They shot. Five people were killed. The rest of the crowd ran away, and that was it. So is that really a massacre? Because it's called the Boston Massacre. Five deaths, and they were the kind of instigators in terms of what began, the violence began. So why did they call it the Boston Massacre? The reason is because of support. In Boston, they're ready to go to war, but the rest of the colonies, the rest of the 13 colonies, not so much. Their attitude is, you're, you want to fight against the most powerful empire in the world, the British? They have the most powerful military in the world, and who are we? We're basically farmers with guns, and you want to take them on in war? People of Boston is like, yeah, let's go. The rest of them is like, no, we can't do that. So this was supposed to be a horrible story that would push other colonies to be angry enough to start supporting this idea of going to war. So the Boston Massacre was born. And as I was told and retold in newspapers, the story changed, and the story got worse. And eventually, it actually sounded like a massacre. The anger continued where they kind of wanted to send King George a message that they were so tired of all these new rules, all these new leaders, all this new everything, and that they had no say in it. And they wanted to show the king that they were upset with all these um, changes and that they had no power. So the Boston Tea Party happened. It was a protest toward the king where they dressed up like Native Americans, pretended to be Native Americans, got onto British ships, and they threw these big crates of tea into the ocean, into the bay. Now, was that tea expensive? Yes. Did it belong to the king? Yes. Did the king go broke because of losing those tea? No. But it was still a message. So what, if you're the king and you're the most powerful man on earth, how do you take this message from your own colonists? They threw your product in the water to send you a message. This made the king very upset and he wanted to send them a message. So he surrounds Boston. And the idea was we're going to surround Boston. No supplies no supplies come in and out. They surround Boston, cut off all supplies. And the main supply is food. Basically, no food was going to go in and out of Boston. And they had some food in Boston, but eventually that would go away. Eventually, they would eat it. And what he was trying to get them to do was to surrender, was to break their spirit about this fighting. Because, again, it's in Boston where they have all this anger over wanting independence. So he wanted to basically have them fall on their knees and say, Okay, okay, okay. We learned our lesson. You're way more powerful. We can't. Um, we won't fight back anymore. We'll stop with this whole independence talk already. It didn't work. Boston survived and they didn't back off because they were able to smuggle food in. Not enough for them to be like super full every day, but just enough not to starve. And it kept going. So the king realized that punishment didn't work. So he set up the intolerable acts. The king and the government set up the intolerable acts. More changes, more measures, more taxes, more rules, and it was straight out just designed to punish them, right? It was set out as a punishment. It wasn't a, we are doing this because we want to raise money because of this, because of that. It was straight out, you guys are behaving like children and you need to be punished. And that's what the intolerable acts, even the name says it, intolerable. Like these acts were intolerable, like you can't tolerate them, they're so bad. And that's exactly what they were aimed at. You're going to act like little children, colonists, I'm going to treat you like little children and punish you. So now the colonies have to make a decision. Now they they pushed it to the king and the king has pushed back and punished them. So they have a meeting and that meeting is called the First Continental Congress. So again, it's just the meeting. 12 of the 13 colonies meet together to decide basically, okay, what do we do now? All right, so the 13 colonies meet together and it's called the First Continental Congress. And in this meeting, they decide to send the king another message by boycotting English goods. So they're basically telling the king, we're not happy with what's going on here. And until you change things, until you let us vote in the government, until you stop putting all these taxes, we are no longer buying British products. So that basically means they're hurting the wallet of the king. So if you're the king, how do you take this one? Not well as well. So it's going to lead to the first actual shooting, which is the Lexington and Concord. 
what happens is the colonists who had been trying to think about going to war, they realize that they need to get weapons. And as they got weapons, they started setting them aside and putting them together in two places just in case there is some sort of fighting. They would have the weapons ready for the soldiers who were ready to fight. And those two places are Lexington and Concord. Well, the British knew, found out that this is where they were and the army is headed to Lexington and Concord. And this is when you get the stories of Paul Revere and William Dawes riding around basically saying the Redcoats are coming, the Redcoats are coming, basically saying the British are coming. And this is where you're also going to get the shot heard around the world. All right. So it's April 19, 1770, 17, I'm sorry, 77 colonists against 700 of the best trained soldiers, best, best equipped soldiers in the world, the British soldiers. So they're on a field and on one side, 700 of the best trained soldiers, best equipped soldiers, and the other side, basically, farmers with guns. And both sides realize, damn, this is going to be a massacre. 77 versus 700 of the best trained soldiers? So the legend says that the British, um, that the colonists started to retreat because they realized, what's the point of fighting? If we fight, we're going to get slaughtered. And the legend says that one of the soldiers slipped, fell, and when he fell, his gun accidentally fired. And when the gun accidentally fired, the British thought that they were being fired upon. So the British started shooting, and they shot at the colonists as they were running away. Eight colonists died, and there is the first battle of the war. This part here, we'll start talking about later. So eight are going to die on the very first day. Very first day, very first battle eight as they were running away now why is it called the shot heard around the world it's called the shot heard around the world not because you know if you were in china and you heard the shot all of a sudden halfway around the world it's because it started the american revolution that ultimately leads to the united states being bored so that that accidental shot is so important that it's shot heard around the world all right so that's the kind of story that i want you to tell in your movie preview so hopefully this helped thank you